Here's how the Lakers racked up 17 NBA championships. From the franchise's most iconic legends. Magic down the middle, just what I thought. A hook shot at 12. Good! down to its most prevalent role players. Do you know how I won three NBA championships with Los Angeles Lakers? Eggs. What? Eggs? What are you talking about? Hard work, defense, rebounding. Eggs. Yeah. You're about to find out the ins and outs of how the purple and gold became more than just a basketball team, but a prestigious brand. Stay tuned. Long before the franchise relocated to Los Angeles, for the Minneapolis Lakers in the 1949 playoffs, George Mikan led the league in scoring, averaging 30.3 points per game, while being second in field goal percentage, shooting 45.4% from the field. Many would beat the Chicago Stags in the division semifinals, the Rochester Royals in the division finals, and the Washington Capitals in the soon-to-be rebranded BAA finals. George, Mr. Basketball Mikan, would lead the playoffs in scoring for a second straight run in 1950, with Jim Pollard and Vin Mickelson contributing a scoring average of 12-plus. Sharpshooting rookie Slater Martin posted a team third-best 42% shooting from the field. Minneapolis would win the original play-in tournament, beating the Royals in an NBA Central Division first-place tiebreaker before sweeping all of the Stags, Fort Wayne Pistons, and Anderson Packers. Then, Mike and company took care of the Syracuse Nationals to win the franchise's second chip. The Lakers' boss movement in 1952 was special, and with third-year pro Slater vamping his point average from 4.2 to 9, the original Jokic, George Mikan, had the help of an additional four players scoring at least that amount, while Bob Cousy of the Celtics would lead this postseason in scoring, with Mikan being third in that department. Mr. Basketball led the playoffs in rebounds per game with 15.9. The original Minnesota franchise swept the Indianapolis Olympians before beating Rochester in the West Finals and culminating in a seven-game thriller, then beat the New York Knicks in the NBA Finals. Despite there not being a three-point line yet, the sniping of the 1953 Lakers was prevalent. Whether it was Jim Pollard who averaged a team's second-best 14.3 points in the postseason, the one-footed mastery of sizzled veteran at that point Slater Martin, or the proficient spot-up marksman Bob Harrison, George Mikan had plenty of help. Many took down Indy in a sweep for a consecutive season, edged out the Fort Wayne Pistons in a five-game best-of-five, and beat the New York Knicks in the finals for a consecutive season as well. In the franchise's fifth championship season, the screening, backdoor cutting, and rebounding of the 1954 Lakers was what stood out. They were molding to the ever-evolving ways of the young game of basketball. Clyde Lavalette, Jim Pollard, and Mikan gave Minneapolis three players averaging 8.5 plus boards per game in the postseason, fueling the franchise to the finals, where they'd face another seven-game test in which they defeated the Syracuse Nationals. An 18-year championship drought would then commence, a time frame in which the franchise relocated to the City of Angels. Jerry West and Wilt Chamberlain was almost like having both Stephen Curry and Shaquille O'Neal in their primes. Terrifying part was, while West and Chamberlain led the team in assists and rebounds, Wilt wasn't even top three on the team in scoring, and the Lakers' scoring leader wasn't the logo either. It was instead Gail Goodrich, who posted 24 points per night in 1972's playoffs, while Jim McMillan and Happy Harrison, in addition to West, Goodrich, and Chamberlain, gave this stacked title-winning roster five 13.5-plus point-per-game scores, Jerry West was 0-7 in the finals leading up to this year and received his long-awaited first ring when LA defeated New York in the finals. Fun facts, now Heat president Pat Riley was a player on this 72 team, and the Lakers won the chip despite Elgin Baylor missing the entire postseason with an Achilles injury. Eight years later, LA would begin the franchise's most dominant decade. With 1975 trade acquisition Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and 1979 first overall draft pick Magic Johnson, despite coach Jack McKinney suffering a near-fatal head injury after falling on his bike after 14 games, assistant Paul Westhead would take over and coach the Lakers to the promised land. The Lakers went 50-18 with Westhead in charge and had four 18-point-per-game scores in Magic, Kareem, Jamal Wilkes, and Norm Nixon three of which who played in all 82 games. Magic played in 77. 
the Lakers would beat the Phoenix Suns, Seattle Supersonics, and Philadelphia 76ers in the postseason to win franchise title number seven. Kareem was league MVP, and Magic was finals MVP. Six games into the 1981-82 season, Magic Johnson requested a trade because he was unhappy playing under Westhead. This resulted in owner Jerry Buss promoting assistant coach Pat Riley and firing Westhead. LA was absolutely stacked this year, with six players in Michael Cooper, Mitch Kupchak, Norm Nixon, Magic Johnson, Jamal Wilkes, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, all averaging at least 12 points per game. Rookie head coach and Pat Riley was evidently fit for the job, getting LA back to the finals, where they beat Philadelphia in six, with Magic winning his second finals MVP. Following two straight years of losing in the finals after that 82 title, L's at the hands of the Sixers and Celtics, Riley coached the Lakers back to the finals in 1985, where Kareem would put on a masterclass. Abdul-Jabbar would average 26 points, 9 rebounds, 5 assists, and over a block and a steal over 6 games against Boston, winning his first finals MVP in 14 years since his days in Milwaukee. The Lakers had a staggering 7 10-plus point-per-game scores in those 1985 playoffs, consisting of Jabbar, James Worthy, who averaged a team's second-most 21.5 points, to go along with Magic, Byron Scott, Bob McAdoo, Mike McGee, and Michael Cooper. Stacked. A couple years later would mark the beginning of the end to a glorious 10-year run with their big three of Magic, Kareem, and Worthy. The Lakers would win a franchise second most up to that point, and third most up to this day, 65 games during the regular season, with Michael Cooper winning Defensive Player of the Year. LA would proceed to sweep the Denver Nuggets in Round 1, Gentlemen sweep the Golden State Warriors in Round 2, sweep the Seattle Supersonics in the Conference Finals, before taking down their rival in the Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish-led Celtics in 6 to win another chip. Magic Johnson was both league and finals MVP. Pushing their championship total up to 11. But it's very, very special because if you can see, yeah. the numbers all go to 11. 1988 saw James Worthy elevate into the team's top score for the playoffs. Worthy would post 21 points, six boards, four and a half dimes, and one and a half steals per game in the postseason. Magic would average a beastly double-double of 19 points and 12.6 assists per game. Byron Scott averaged just under 20, all which worked to make up for an aging Kareem. Abdul-Jabbar was still productive, posting a 14-point-per-game average, but certainly far from his prime, all-time great self. Nevertheless, LA would sweep the San Antonio Spurs in the first round, then edge out seven-game series Ws against the Utah Jazz in round two, the Dallas Mavericks in Round 3, and the Detroit Pistons in the NBA Finals. In the midst of a rebuilding era during the 1990s, the summer of 1996 was when Dr. Jerry Buss went deep into his pockets to sign Shaquille O'Neal to a seven-year $120 million contract, the same summer in which they drafted Kobe Bryant 13th overall. By their third year together in 1999-2000, Shaq and Kobe were an absolute cheat code having developed chemistry which served as some of the most overpowering cohesion in which a one-two punch had provided in NBA history. Shaq would win Finals MVP, All-Star Game MVP, and League MVP, while averaging 31 points and 15 rebounds in the 2000 playoffs. Kobe would lead the Lakers in steals and assists per game, while chipping in 21 points per night himself, as franchise chip number 12 had been locked down. While Denver had an all-time dominant championship run in 2023, maybe nothing tops what the Lakers did in 2001. They would sweep the entirety of the Western Conference, not losing a single game to the Trailblazers, Kings, or Spurs in the first three rounds before gentlemen sweeping Reggie Miller and the Pacers in the NBA Finals. Kobe and Shaq both averaged around 30 for the championship run, but this time, they had the help of two additional 10-plus point-per-game scores in third option Derek Fisher and fourth option the Eggman Rick Fox. Is there a deli that will deliver 12 dozen hard-boiled eggs to me right now? 12 dozen or like 12 eggs? I forget it. Well, no, I know. I mean, I can, I can look it up. No, I can look, also... if you don't have it at the top of your head, it's not worth it to me. 
off. And then just make the bed. Okay, sorry. I don't just... be sorry. Just give me the eggs. You said forget it. I say a lot of things. I said make the bet, didn't I? Whoa. Are you the egg man? Are you Rick Fox? Cuckoo, kachoo, Jakey, are you the egg man or not? Shaq would win a second consecutive finals MVP, and the Lakers would repeat as world champs. At this point, Los Angeles hadn't three-peated since their name was Minneapolis way back in 1954. So in 2002, they faced a dire task. Under legendary coach Phil Jackson, who'd been the man in charge since 1999-2000 when the Lakers won their first ring of this new era, things went according to plan through the first two rounds of the playoffs as they swept the Portland Trailblazers before beating San Antonio in five. The turbulence occurred in the conference finals where the Sacramento Kings gave them a serious run for their money. The Kings had the best record in the NBA during the regular season, winning 61 games. They had a balanced powerhouse consisting of seven double-digit scores in Chris Webber, Paige Stoyakovich, Mike Bibby, Doug Christie, Vladi Divac, and Hito Turkoglu. Sacramento would take a 2-1 series lead and seemed to have sealed Game 4. The Kings were up by as many as 24 points in the first half amidst a conference finals outing that would have put them up 3-1. However, Los Angeles would storm back in the final 24 minutes, cutting the deficit to two with only seconds remaining. Following both a Kobe missed layup and a Shaq missed putback, Sacramento's Vladi Divas would tap out the miss, leading Robert Ori to do this. The iconic dagger would knot up the series at two in a matchup the Lakers would win in seven. LA wouldn't have nearly as much trouble with the Jason Kidd-led Nets in the conference finals as they'd sweep New Jersey to make it a clean Hollywood three-peat. Seven seasons later in 2009, with Shaq having been traded to Miami several years prior, Kobe had the chance to be the number one alpha dog on a team that had the potential to compete for a title. At the 08 trade deadline, the Lakers dealt for Pau Gasol in a deal which included Kwame Brown, giving Stephen A. Smith his most iconic rant of all time. Did L.A. give up too much to get a guy who has been labeled soft, although he puts up 19 and 9, which only 11 other guys do? Is that a trick question? You tell me. They gave up Kwame Brown. Two who first cares? Rounders. Better yet, this gave Kobe Bryant another elite big man to work with. Slowly but surely, despite losing the 2008 Finals to Boston, the two-man game of Bryant and Gasol would find NBA superiority. Lamar Odom, Trevor Ariza, in addition to Bryant and Gasol, gave LA four 11-plus point-per-game scores in the 09 playoffs. Kobe averaged over 30 points, leading the team in all of scoring, steals, assists, and minutes played. Pau averaged 18 points on 11 rebounds, leading the team in all of rebounding, blocks, and field goal percentage. Derek Fisher had some big games in this 09 playoff run as well, but really the storyline here was Kobe being the clear-cut number one on a championship roster. Looking to go back-to-back -back in 2010, the summer earlier saw LA acquire lockdown wing defender Ron Artest. Artest wouldn't only add defense and toughness, but a crucial touch of scoring, which was really important given they didn't have Trevor Ariza back for this season. Artest led the Lakers in steals per game in 2010's postseason, while Kobe led the team in scoring by far for a second straight run. The Bryant-Gasol Lakers defeated a rising KD Westbrook and Harden-led OKC team in six, swept the Darren Williams-Carlos Boozer-led Utah Jazz, beat the Steve Nash-Amari Stoudemire-led Suns in the conference finals, before getting revenge for their 08 finals loss to the Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen-led Boston Celtics in a hard-fought, down-to-the-wire, seven-game battle. Kobe had cemented all-time great status with a fifth championship and second straight as the main option. Skipping ahead a decade of rebuilding, and the 2020 Lakers featured all-time great LeBron James, who they signed in free agency two years earlier, perennial All-NBA player Anthony Davis, who they traded for a year earlier, in addition to a flurry of well-suited, defensively capable, and for the most part, heavily experienced role players. Kyle Kuzma was the exception to that, but provided much-needed youth 
not to mention solid scoring and shooting prowess. However, the key role players consisted of Contavious Caldwell Pope, to go along with Alex Caruso, Danny Green, Rajon Rondo, Markeith Morris, Dwight Howard, and JaVale McGee. The run was highlighted by the fact that LeBron and AD were the best duo the franchise had since Kobe and Shaq. Anthony and LeBron posted a nearly identical point-per-game average of just under 28, and they both shot similar percentages from both the field and from deep. The finals MVP went to LeBron because of the fact that he led LA in the 2020 playoffs in rebounds and assists per game by a sizable margin. The Lakers took out Portland, Houston, and Denver in five games before being pushed to a Game 6 by Jimmy Butler and the Miami Heat in the NBA Finals. It was a run that'll be remembered for bringing hope to a Laker fan base still mourning the recent passing of Kobe Bryant. And there you have it, 17 rings painted purple and gold. If you enjoyed that video and want to see more, help the channel reach 100k by subscribing. This was DFlow, and I'll see you next video.